or maybe more accurately, a very narrow definition of spirituality, that we can lose touch with uh, taking action in the world. Uh, faith without results, if you want to paraphrase James very, very loosely. On the other hand, if we're part of working for social justice, it's also easy to lose our sense of connection to God and to slip in our spiritual footing. The arc of history is long, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, but it bends towards justice. But sometimes the bend in the arc seems very, very long indeed. When we see all the social ills that persist in spite of the brilliant and sacrificial work that many good people over the course of hundreds and even thousands of years have done. And it's easy to fall into a kind of a secular mindset to explain and describe these challenges that befall humankind. But by doing that, we can be drained of our hope and our sense of purpose in the work. So that's the question that I'm working around. How do you keep spirituality and social justice connected? And I don't necessarily have an answer in this sermon, maybe next week, but I do want to meditate on what social justice look like, looks like or what it could be like as envisioned in the Bible. And for these three weeks, I'll be focusing on basic needs, uh, food, clothing, and shelter, as a way to sort of break off discrete, discrete chunks of the bigger abstraction that's called social justice. My hope is that in the process, we'll put a few more stones in the bridge that spans the gap between justice and spirituality, between head and heart, between thought and action. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, all we have comes from you. Grace us once again with your holy presence. Fill our hearts with your love and your courage and strengthen our hands to do your holy work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when I was in high school, we ate lunch in the commons, which was kind of set up like a mall food court, but with more carpeted places to sit on and um, more concrete columns. And then the tables, it was kind of like an open space over it. It reminded me of a food court. Anyway, and then the tables were different in that they would hold eight or ten people at a time, big circles, at least some of them. So it was pretty easy to sit together with a group of your friends who happened to have the same lunch hour. And people did tend to sit with their friends. It was kind of the normal thing to do. In my case, I was sitting with fellow marching band enthusiasts. And since the school... <laughs> what? <laughs> that's, that's exactly what we always called ourselves, too. Since the school was almost all white, the black kids mostly sat together at one table. And then there was the rebellious crowd who sat on the floor over by the windows. And I probably should have been paying more attention uh, because I don't really remember what the other groups were. But uh, what I do remember that it was, was that it was kind of assigned seating, right? That once you figured out about what table you and your friends liked, which somehow did relate to where others were sitting in a careful calculus of social relationships, then that's where you ate for the whole semester until your lunch schedule changed. And then you tried to get the same table back the next semester if you could swing it. Now, I wouldn't say that my eating habits today are exclusive to the way that they were when I was in high school. In fact, I feel like they are way more exclusive. To be honest, it's fairly uncommon for me to eat with anyone besides Heather and Ann, right? That's my normal thing is I eat with Ann, or she eats and I eat, whatever. I, it, it, she eats her on her own schedule. Uh, once maybe every couple of weeks, I'll eat with somebody else who is not one of those two wonderful people. And for folks who work outside the home, I'd be interested to know your reaction to this. Um, it's much more common for people to eat alone at their desks than to eat with their fellow employees, at least on a regular basis, the way we did in high school. Right? Does anybody sit down every day with coworkers to eat lunch? Heather does. Oh, do you? Do you go to the lunchroom? And... Oh, that's awesome. All right, well, that throws that out of the window. All right, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. My, my sermon is crumbling <laughs> before you. Yeah. 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 Well, right. That was how it was at 
my last job where that was possible. Anyway, look at me. So, so I'm kind of getting nostalgic for high school, actually, thinking about this. But All right, not really. Okay. I'm nostalgic now for Heather's place of employment. <sighs> Um, So in Jesus' day, there was even more of a conscious recognition about eating together as a social event. It was a cue that the person you were eating with was a trusted person, uh, an official friend, not just somebody you met online, right? No? Okay. Eating together had meanings associated with social standing, and there were certain people that a respectable person simply should not eat with. Like there would be... uh, there would be times when people would say, I will not eat with that person, right? Uh, there were respectable people, and then there were the sinners. Um, and that was like a particular class of folks, people who had made a living in morally suspect ways, like prostitution or collecting taxes and bribes with the backing of the Roman occupiers. And Jesus, as part of his ministry, in this context, consciously broke those barriers down by eating with a wide variety of people, and not just his friends. And the community the communion meal that we'll celebrate today is in some ways a recording or a ritual remembering of that ministry. Uh, so what's always been a little funny to me about communion is that even though it comes from this deep well of generosity and abundance, Jesus is desire to go out and get the people who are lost. Um, He's kind of like a shepherd who goes out into the wilderness and he rounds up all the raggedy and the directionally challenged sheep, right? That There are a lot of times that the actual thing that we get when we come up to the communion rail is very tightly controlled. It's like a tiny shot glass of juice, right? And a little round, perfect circle of what is called bread, Right? <laughs> there's, a, there's some theologian who says it, that believing in communion, the hardest part is not believing that the bread is Jesus, but that um, the wafer is bread. Right? <laughs> now, I don't want to get you wrong. When I was a kid, I totally loved those little tiny glasses because I'm like, oh, it's my size. You know, I love it. And then, and it's still, when you um, have the communion wafer and you have the. Um, you have the little shot glass of juice. There is no mistaking that you're in a church, right? Nowhere else do we... You wouldn't go to the wine bar and order, like... No? Okay. But as far as capturing a sense of this Jesus as someone who ate with everybody and liked to kind of spill over into people's lives and build relationships between unusual characters, um, I think that the messy exuberance gets a little lost in in those symbols. So... For me, the church potluck might actually get closer to the spirit of the original communion meals. Which kind of brings me to today's scripture reading from Isaiah, or at least that's where I need to go in the sermon for it to continue. Isaiah with No. <laughs> that was probably the worst transition I've ever written. Okay. Isaiah was... Nobody thinks this is funny. All right. Isaiah was writing to the people of Israel... So the thing we just read, Isaiah was reading to the people of Israel near the end of the Babylonian captivity, which was, fittingly enough, a time when most of the people of Israel were taken captive and forced to move from their homeland to the city of Babylon, Babylonian captivity. And the miracle of this story is that after 70 years, they were allowed to go back, uh, which nobody saw coming. Except Isaiah, I guess, because the writer of Isaiah in this reading, although he doesn't know that they're going to be going back, he's hoping. And he, it, he does know for sure, and he paints a picture of what God's dream is for the people of Israel. Come, God calls out. Everyone who is hungry, come and eat. If you're thirsty, I have water to drink. Eat food that satisfies. Don't waste your money. Don't waste your energy. The text goes on by describing David, the greatest king of Israel, and Israel itself as a nation that is doing God's work by drawing people to it. All the nations, drawing all the nations all around the world to um, Israel. God's gift is to the world through Israel to come and to eat. And the boundaries that we draw between foreigner and native, between outsider and insider, accepted and rejected, come down in the face of God's generous invitation to come and eat. 
So what does it look like then to eat food that satisfies? What does it mean for there to be justice in the realm of food, of, of eating? I see a few different threads coming from Isaiah and from Jesus' practices of feeding and eating with the people that he taught. First, a just food system means there is enough for everyone. Already the world grows enough food for every person to eat, and yet somehow people still die of malnutrition. And how does that happen? In Isaiah's voice, God calls everyone to eat. In Jesus' hands, five loaves of bread and two fish feed 5,000 men. Plus, you know, their appendage, women and children. Anyway, that's another story. Maryland food... <laughs> right? That's how they count them. And the stories are like, 5,000 plus women and children. Okay. So, you know... Anyway. That's a later sermon. Okay, Maryland, so, Mar- so organizations like Maryland Food Bank, which we just saw pictures of, or the Baltimore Free Farm, or Heifer International, organizations like that work on different pieces of this puzzle, trying to make it so that food that is grown can get into the hands of the people who need it. Secondly, a just food system means not just enough food, but good food. Food that satisfies, as in only organic, vegan, and gluten-free. Okay? All right, not really, not really. But not all food is the same. Some food is grown and sold in ways that respect the earth and the plants and the animals that produce the food. And it's good for our health and it tastes good to eat. Other food fails those tests. And as buyers and perhaps as gardeners, anyone, we can make choices about the food that we eat and its impact on the natural world and its healthfulness and its tastiness. Third, living into Jesus' kingdom and the way that we eat means an ongoing attitude and practice of gratitude for the food and the way it nourishes our bodies and gives us pleasure. Simply saying grace at every meal is a spiritual practice that reminds and opens us up to God's grace and the complex web of relationships that make each of our meals possible. Finally, along with enough food, with good food, appreciated food, the food that satisfies is food that connects us to each other in a shared meal. Jesus asks us to remember him each time we break bread together. So let's keep being about the business of eating together, not only with our little circles of friends, not only with the so-called respectable people, not only at our desk looking at our computer screen, but with the unexpected people in unexpected ways. And when we do find that opportunity to connect across the table, my prayer is that we will see Christ in the face of the person eating with us. May it be so. Thanks be to God. Amen.